Hey there, and welcome back to Englishes Around the World. Today, we'll be doing something a little different. Namely, we'll be working with a database that contains lots of authentic texts from different varieties of English. That database is called the GLOBE, and it is what linguists call a corpus. Now, if you've never worked with a corpus before, this is actually a great place to start because it's really easy it's free to use and it gives you lots of interesting insights into language use across different varieties of English. What's even better is that the corpus is accessible online. And so with everything that I'm going to show you in this video, you can just follow along on your computer at home at the same time. At several points, I will ask you to pause the video and to try out things for yourself so that you can see exactly how I am getting the results that you see on my slides. The overall goal for us in this video would be to get you to a point where you can use the globe to make comparisons between different varieties of English with regard to several levels of linguistic organization. We'll chiefly be looking at the levels of the lexicon, that is of words, and then the grammatical levels of morphology and syntax, that is word structure and the organization of phrases and sentences. I also hope to show you that the GLOBE corpus combines really well with other resources that I've been presenting in this series, uh, specifically the eWave, the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. Okay, so if you're ready, then I suggest that we get started. My plan for this video is as follows. Uh, first of all, I want to show you some basic functions of the GLOBE interface. Then we'll be looking at word frequencies compared across different varieties of English. We'll also look at a few cases of grammatical variation. And then we'll be working with sections. Uh, the globe is structured in such a way that you can compare uh, varieties of English side by side, and you can choose exactly which varieties you can compare against one another. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, collocates and we'll be looking at different words and what other words co-occur with them in different varieties of English. Right, now before we start, uh, let me say a few words about the person behind the globe corpus, Mark Davies. Mark has been working as a professor of linguistics at Brigham Young University and he has been a pioneer in bringing corpus linguistics to the people, that is to you and me. Corpus linguistics used to be a highly specialized discipline that required specific software and quite a bit of knowledge about computers. And Mark has been making resources such as the globe available on the web so that you and I can use them for free. Uh, many of Mark's corpora contain English data, but there are also corpora of Spanish and of Portuguese. And I often use Mark's corpora with my students in class simply because they're fun to use. And uh, they're also great for homework assignments. They're great for term papers. There's really a lot that you can do with them. I've met Mark a few times at conferences and he's just a great guy all around. So we're extremely lucky to have him. Not all heroes wear capes. Some of them put corpora on the web. And Mark doesn't only create corpora, he also produces research based on those corpora. So some of the ideas that I'll talk about in this video come from a paper that he has co-authored with Robert Fuchs. It's called Expanding Horizons in the Study of World Englishes. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below so that you can read up on all the details. Right, so let's get started and let's check out some of the basic functions of the GLOBE interface. Now, you can access the globe simply by going to the webpage english-corpora.org uh, forward slash globe. Okay, globe is spelled a little weirdly. So um, it's uh, the, the verb glow, okay, and then B and an E at the end. So in globe, it's actually a silent E. Uh, when you go to that webpage, you'll be able to uh, see this kind of window that you have on the slide here and you'll be able to conduct a few searches just like that. And after that, you'll get a request to create an account. Uh, creating an account is free. So I would suggest that you go ahead and do that. 
and it would not be entirely impractical to do that right now. So if you want to follow along, pause the video here, take two minutes to register and then come back. That said, if you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. You can just watch the video and check out what I'm doing here. Okay, let's look at this in a bit more detail. Um, so the most important field of this interface is the search window, the white window that you see here. Uh, so this functions pretty much like a Google search window. That is, you can type in all kinds of stuff, words and phrases, and the interface will retrieve those words and phrases from the corpus. It will give you results. So let's make this more concrete. Here I've just typed in uh, cats and dogs. And if I want to retrieve examples of that search string, all I need to do is click the button that says find matching strings. Okay, so if you're following along, type in something, you know, some word of your choice or a few words uh, that you want to look for and then uh, type find matching strings. And if you do that, there will be a display of the results, which is what you see on this slide. Okay, so you see these four writers at the top of the interface, search, frequency, context, overview. So a minute ago we were in search, yeah? And uh, if we ask for the results, we'll be taken to the writer that says frequency. And we have uh, a display of the results here. So you see the search pattern, cats and dogs, and you see a number that represents the overall number of hits that have been found in the corpus, the overall number of examples. And then there's a series of numbers that uh, show you how often the search string was found across the different varieties of English. <clears throat> so um, the first couple of cells here represent inner circle varieties of English. That is uh, US English, Canada English, Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. Okay, and the colors, they actually have meaning too. They show you how frequent a word or an expression is across these varieties. So the darker a cell is, the more frequent in relative terms uh, that phrase or that word is in that variety. I'll come back to this in just a second. Now, if we move on to the right, uh, we see a number of outer circle varieties, including Indian English, Sri Lanka English, Pakistani English, uh, BD stands for Bangladesh, then we have Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, Hong Kong, uh, South Africa, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Jamaica. So a really wide variety of um, outer circle varieties that we can work with. Now, importantly, uh, the numbers that you see here are what corpus linguists call raw frequencies. Mm, they represent how many examples, how many hits there were in each of the varieties. But some of you might already be thinking, well, how much data is there in the corpus? Are all varieties represented with the same amount of data? Well, as it turns out, uh, there are different amounts of data for different varieties, and that's quite important uh, to take into account. So let us redo our search and let's change one thing. Now, all we have to do is go back to the search interface. You do so by clicking on the writer that says uh, search. Yeah. And uh, there we need to change one setting. Namely, we need to change the kind of search that we're doing from list to chart. Okay. So a moment ago we were in list mode and now we're going into chart mode. <clears throat> and if you click on that word that says chart, uh, something else changes. Namely, uh, down here, the search button will show the words C frequency by section. Okay. If you see that, then you're good to go. Then you can actually just click C frequency by section and you'll be taken again to the results page, uh, the, the writer that says chart. Okay. And um, this time we see a bar chart and there are three lines with frequency data. There are the raw frequencies that we saw just a minute ago. Yeah, those are exactly the same. 
Um, and uh, in the second line, there are the corpus sizes, yeah, namely the words counted in millions that are represented in the corpus. And uh, as you can see, there are lots and lots of words in the corpus. Overall, um, it's 1.9 billion words, so 1,900 million words. And uh, for example, US English is represented with almost 400 million words uh, right now. So I'm recording this in November 2020. Okay, um, in the last line, we uh, learn about the uh, relative frequencies, the normalized frequencies of uh, the search pattern that we put in. So um, <clears throat> the bars actually reflect these uh, normalized frequencies. So there you can see immediately which varieties have more hits and which varieties have fewer hits. So cats and dogs, for some reason, is uh, relatively frequent in Malaysian English and New Zealand English, but not so frequent in Bangladeshi English. Yeah, um, right. So with that basic info under our belts, let's go and check out some word frequencies across varieties. Cats and dogs, I mean, that's kind of trivial. Let's search for some words where we actually expect to see some meaningful differences. And uh, there's one word that I want to start with uh, that some of you may recognize and others not. Uh, the word is la, L-A-H, yeah, uh, L-A-H, sorry. Um, all right, so do me a favor and type that into the search window. We're still in the chart option. We can leave it uh, like that. And I just want you to hit frequency, see frequency by section. Um, if you do that, uh, the results will give you uh, this bar chart here, which is astonishingly clear. Yeah, so la is a word that exists and is reasonably frequent in Singapore English and in Malaysian English, but it is not at all frequent in all the other varieties. Yeah, and that is because la is a discourse particle that is very frequent in uh, Singapore English and Malaysian English. There it uh, is used practically all the time in spoken spontaneous conversation and in some of the uh, more informal written texts that are contained in the globe. Yeah, so if you're wondering, well, what kind of data is represented in the globe? These are texts that are found on the web, that are gathered from the web and that represent domains of those respective countries. Okay, now something you can do in this interface is that you can click on the bars uh, to see actual examples. So if you click into the bars of Singapore English or Malaysian English, that will actually take you to another part of the interface, the context interface, where you're able to see actual examples. Um, I've done that here. So I've clicked on Malaysia and here you see some of the examples where this uh, discourse particle la is found. Yeah, not bad, la. Um, <clears throat> I'm not very experienced, la, come on, la, and so on and so forth. So even if you have no idea at all how uh, Malaysian English works, well, this gives you a first impression of how this discourse particle is used in actual authentic writing on the web. Right, um, just one other example here. Uh, I don't know if all of you know what wellies are. Yeah, if you do, you know, let me know in the comments below. Um, so do me a favor, type in wellies. Again, we're in the chart mode, C frequency by section, and uh, you maybe already have a hypothesis about in what varieties wellies might be especially frequent. Let's look at this. So um, unsurprisingly, perhaps to some of you, wellies are frequent in uh, British English and in Irish English, but above and beyond that, there is not much going on. In most other parts of the world, wellies are called rubber boots, yeah? And uh, the Wellington branch, uh, the Wellington brand hasn't been able to establish itself very firmly 
in other parts of the world as a provider of reliable and nice rubber boots. Okay, so these are just some of the things that you can do with the Globe uh, Corpus. And of course, we can also click into Great Britain uh, and look at some of the actual examples. And um, if you didn't know what wellies are, you know, you could click on these examples, look at the context and see how that particular word is used. Get your wellies on, uh, waterproof clothing and wellies. You need to hang up your wellies um, and so on and so forth. Right, so what I would like you to do now is to pause this video and to try this out for yourself. So do me a favor and search for the following words, all of which describe the same thing. Yeah, the words are loo, toilet, restroom, washroom, and uh, find out for yourself which word is used in which variety. Yeah, If you want to do that, I'm going to continue with the results in three, two, one. Here we go. Yeah. So um, again, some of you would have known that Lou is a term that is decidedly British. Yeah. But the globe gives you a few pieces of additional information, namely that Lou is also a current term in Singapore and Malaysian English. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, toilet is uh, more evenly distributed, I would say. Yeah. <clears throat> then restroom. Uh, is something of an Americanism and washroom is what you say in Canada. Yeah. Um, you can look at the outer circle varieties. Yeah. And uh, see if they pattern more with the British model or with the American model or if they're doing something else entirely. Um, so it doesn't seem that any outer circle variety has really the, uh, adopted the Canadian washroom uh, term. Anyway, um, let's do another little exercise here and uh, search for the words cell phone, mobile phone, and then hand phone. And hand phone you can spell either with a break between hand and phone or you can just type it in as one word. Okay, so check this out for yourself. Uh, which word is used in which varieties? And I'll continue here with the results in three, two, one. Here we go. So um, what we see with cell phone and mobile phone is something of a contrast between, again, US English and uh, British English. Mobile phone is relatively more frequent in uh, Great Britain. Yeah. And cell phone is relatively more frequent in, uh, in the US. Um, so it always is a good idea to look at the uh, frequencies uh, per million words. So cell phone in US English has about 15 hits per million words and about five mobile phone has about five per million words. So it's a ratio of three to one, you could say. Yeah. Uh, if we're looking at cell phone and mobile phone in uh, British English, it's about the reverse. Yeah. So we have 3.2 instances per million for a cell phone and we have 18.4 for mobile phone. So again, well, um, this is a bit more pronounced than what we saw in British English, but nonetheless in the same ballpark. Um, then across all the other varieties, um, well, it doesn't seem to be that much of a contrast. Uh, the differences are not that stark, if you like. However, there's something interesting going on with handphone. Uh, namely, handphone is frequent in Singapore English and Malaysian English. You see that here. Yeah. Um, however, when you look at the um, normalized frequencies, you see that handphone uh, in both of its spellings is really not that frequent overall, yeah, in uh, Singapore English and Malaysian English. So handphone without the white space is at about 4.5 or 4 instances per million words. And if we compare that to mobile phone, yeah, there we have 16 point something or almost 15. So really, um, well, handphone is typical 
for Malaysian English, for Singapore English, but mobile phone is more frequent still. Yeah. Um, so it's just that we have this extra variant, which however is not the most frequent one. That's kind of important to keep in mind. Right. Um, I want to look at some cases of grammatical variation. And here I directly like you to try this for yourself. The phenomenon that we're looking at is uh, mass nouns with a plural ending. Okay, Mass nouns have this grammatical characteristic in British and American English that they don't pluralize, at least not very regularly. But um, this is handled differently across different varieties of English. And I'd like you to find out how this works. Okay, So if you do me a favor and search for the words equipments, researches and informations. Yeah. Um, if uh, these words sound a little funny to you, yeah, maybe because you're a speaker of, let's say, Australian English or American English. Well, just wait and see what other speakers of Englishes in the world do with these words. OK, um, so equipment normally is a mass noun and uh, you can talk about several pieces of equipment. But uh, equipments is not a word that you would frequently hear in British English or American English. And the same goes for researchers, informations and other mass nouns. Right. Do me a favor and do this now and I'll talk about the results right now. Here we go. So what we see with regard to these mass nouns with plural endings is that there is an asymmetry across inner circle varieties and outer circle varieties. So the inner circle varieties, that is US English, Canada, Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. If you look, for example, at equipments, there is some kind of residue there. Yeah. So these words show up in a gigantic corpus, but uh, the frequencies are much lower and um, well, systematically lower than in the outer circle varieties. OK, so here we have Indian English. Uh, it's very frequent in Bangladeshi English equipments, Hong Kong English, Tanzania. So this is something that, for example, the uh, Southeast Asian varieties and the African varieties have in common. OK, there are some features that uh, Asian and African outer circle varieties have in common. There are other features where they don't particularly agree with one another, but this is one where uh, they pattern together. And it's not just equipments. It's also the case with researches. It's also the case with informations. So this is something that is a general phenomenon. Mass nouns can be pluralized much more easily in outer circle varieties than in inner circle varieties. One little thing that I still want to mention here is that uh, when you look at South Africa and uh, Jamaica, you see that those varieties don't really pattern along with the uh, other outer circle varieties. And there are reasons for that. Yeah. If you are onto the reasons, let me know in the comments. Other than that, I would just let you figure out why uh, South African English or Jamaican English might be patterning a little different than other outer circle varieties. Right. Um, now let's move on to a different example. Again, pause this video if you like. Um, I'm talking about the uh, varieties, the, the, the variants of uh, had got and had gotten. OK, maybe in your introduction to linguistics class, uh, your teacher, your instructor has talked about this and uh, you have a vague memory that, oh yeah, had gotten is more frequent in, well, what variety was that again? Yeah, maybe you know it, uh, but if you don't, and even if you do, do me a favor and check this in the corpus and see uh, whether had got or had gotten is more or less frequent across these different varieties. Let's go. OK, what we're seeing here is again an asymmetry between British English and American English. So gotten is relatively more frequent 
in American English. Yeah, we're looking at the normal at the normalized frequencies here. So had gotten appears about 4.3 times per million words. Had got only 1.2 times. And for uh, British English, it's kind of the other way around. Had got uh, 5.8 and had gotten 1.4. Um, with regard to the other uh, varieties, I'll let you figure out by yourself uh, those varieties where there are really strong asymmetries. Uh, one that jumps out, for example, is Sri Lanka, which really patterns with the British model. Yeah? So had got is very frequent, had gotten is not frequent at all. <clears throat> and um, yeah, um, let's look maybe at Filipino English here. Um, in many cases, Filipino English adopts the American model, and we could argue that it does here, but the difference is not particularly striking. So had gotten, there we have 2.9 instances per million words, and had got, and we have 1.9. Yeah? So the uh, asymmetry is nowhere near as strong as with American English per se. Okay, one last example. I'd like you to uh, search for three different patterns, namely different to, different from, and different than. If you want to say that two things differ, yeah, and one is different to the other, from the other, or, or, or than the other, which one is it? Yeah, Can you really be sure? And if you have a feeling that it ought to be one and not another, could that be because you uh, are speaking a certain variety of English? Yeah? Have you secretly been influenced by, for example, Australian English? You can find out by searching for these patterns and then comparing which one is used more across different varieties. Let's go. I'm going to continue in three, two, one. Here we are. Okay, so. Uh, let's first look at the middle panel here, different from, which is something of the consensus. Yeah? When we're looking at the normalized frequencies, the per million frequencies, uh, we see that those are actually the highest yeah? when you compare that to different than and different to. So uh, on average, they're, well, at 30 instances per million. And you see that the varieties sort of pattern together. This is something of a compromise. Um, of course, some varieties have more different from than others. Singapore has 46.6 per million. And um, Ireland, for example, you know, the Irish, they don't seem to compare things all that much. Um, 20.96 instances per million. Um, but then, of course, Irish English also has different two. Yeah? So let's look at that next. Um, different two is most frequent in Australian English, where it reaches uh, about 23 instances per million words. Yeah? But that is really, uh, well, not matched by other varieties that also have this phrasing. Uh, British English has it. Yeah, but it is less frequent than different from. <clears throat> and uh, well, in Irish English, I guess the two are more or less the same. Uh, but Australian English, their different two is actually, well, not quite as frequent as different from, but almost. Yeah, so we have an almost 50 50 kind of scenario in Australia. Uh, moving on to different than. I like to say different than, yeah, but uh, it's an Americanism, apparently. So the US and Canada, they are head and shoulders above all the other varieties with regard to different than. So if different than sounds kind of funny to you, then it's probably because in your day to day interactions with speakers of English, you don't uh, see all that many American speakers or Canadian speakers on a daily basis. Okay, I would like to show you a few things that are a bit more complex than just searching for words as such. The globe interface allows you to formulate powerful search patterns with wildcards 
and with tags. So you can search for word classes rather than for individual words. Let's look at the search pattern that we see here on this slide. Uh, this pattern comes in three parts. The first part is just the verb stop in angular brackets. And what this does is that it finds all forms of the verb stop. So it finds the basic form stop, it finds the present tense form stops, it finds stopped, it finds stopping, and you catch all of this with just one expression. The next part of the search pattern is uh, PRON in all caps, and uh, that doesn't look for a word as such. That is a technical expression. It finds any and all pronouns. That is, it looks for a word class rather than a word as such. And then lastly, we have this expression here, which is what linguists call a tag. So this looks for a particular word form, in this case, a form of a verb. Yeah. So we have a V that stands for a verb. We have a G at the very end of it. And this specifies that we're looking for a specific verb form, namely the ING form. Okay. Now, if you're writing a search pattern like this, you can either type it in like that, or you can click on this box to the right of the search window, which will give you a drop down menu of different forms to choose from. Okay, so this will propose several kinds of word classes and word forms that you can then use to formulate really powerful searches. Okay, so let's try and understand what this uh, search pattern will really uh, try to find. It will try to find a form of the verb to stop, like stopped, and then a pronoun, stopped me, and then a uh, verb form with an ing at the end. Yeah, Stopped me trying, maybe. Okay, this may sound funny to you. So uh, let's see if there is any variety in the globe that actually has examples for this particular search pattern. Uh, do me a favor and uh, click on C frequency by section and that will take us to the uh, chart portion of the interface. Here we go. And what we see is that this kind of pattern is uh, very infrequent across most varieties of the globe, including US English and Canadian English. However, it is relatively frequent in British English and um, well, it also occurs in Irish English, Australian English and New Zealand English. So let's look at a few examples so that we know what this kind of construction does. Here we have the examples. Yeah, so you can just click on one of the bars or you can directly go to context and you will see those examples. I'm going to read some of them to you. So these, those at the top want to stop us looking at anything which points to a wider scandal. Too often treatments available may stop you dying from cancer. Uh, there's nothing to stop you contacting. In place to stop them handing over and so on and so forth. So we see that the search pattern has actually worked. We have different forms of the verb to stop. Uh, the basic form, stop, but also the present tense, stops. Here we have a past tense, stopped, so that worked. We have different pronouns, us, you, them, her, yeah? And then of course, different verbs, looking, dying, contacting, handing, all of them, of course, in the ing form. Now, I wanted to show you this construction because it is not at all used in the kind of English that, that I'm using on a daily basis, uh, but it is very frequent in British English and as we've seen, Irish, Australian and uh, New Zealand English. Yeah. Um, so the globe allows you to check variation at the level of grammar between different varieties of English. And it allows you to find certain constructions that are maybe typical of only a handful of varieties. So this would be the case here. Right, I want to look at one more example here. And uh, this example involves the following search pattern and we'll figure out together what kind of construction this search pattern finds. Right, so, we again start with a pronoun. 
So that is familiar to you by now. Then we have the verb to be in angular brackets. So this will find be, is, was, um, being, and so on and so forth. Then we have uh, the word like, a comma, and uh, double quotation marks. Now, can you imagine what kind of construction this pattern would find? Um, you can maybe think about it for a second, and then you would say, and he was like, man, that's fantastic. That's a fantastic search pattern. So this search pattern finds the quotative be like, I was like, yeah, of course, he was like, no way, and so on and so forth. So let's see in what varieties the uh, be like quotative is particularly frequent. Um, here we have the chart and we see that, well, that's maybe not such a big surprise. Uh, American English, there we have it. Uh, Canadian English is uh, not quite as frequent. British English, not so much. Irish English, even less. Australian, a bit more. Um, and then we have uh, some outer circle varieties where it doesn't uh, have a whole lot of currency. Yeah, so India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, not so much. Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines. So there it has a solid footing, I would say. And also across uh, different African varieties like in Ghana and Tanzania. Uh, and also, well, uh, across the ocean in Jamaica, uh, people are like, yeah, we say that all the time. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, and if you click into any of the bars, you can uh, look at the individual examples from the respective varieties. So here I clicked on the Singapore bar and uh, here are the examples. Yeah, I was like, those people are idiots. Um, but when I read your comment, I was like, yeah, he seems to answer differently every time and so on and so forth. So uh, I would always recommend that you click on the actual bars to see the examples just to make sure that your search pattern found the kinds of examples that you wanted to search for in the first place. All right. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that the globe works really well together with the e-wave. And I want to elaborate that on that a little bit. So here we have a feature from the e-wave namely the addition of two, where standard English has the bare infinitive. For example, in a construction such as he made me to do it. Okay, so um, the map tells us that this feature is supposedly frequent or even obligatory in, for example, um, different varieties in Africa. This is probably Malaysian English. This is Chinese Pidgin English. Uh, this, I guess, is Butler English. Um, so let's check what happens when we feed that kind of search pattern into the globe and search for actual authentic examples. Can we replicate the uh, information that we've been given here by the e-wave on the basis of authentic corpus data. Here we go. So the way I formulated the search pattern was I um, searched for the verb make in all of its forms. So again, I'm using angular brackets here. Then we have any kind of pronoun, yeah? Make me, make him, made her, and so on and so forth. Two, that's the crucial element, yeah? We're looking for examples with the two rather than nothing. And then uh, underline V question mark I searches for verbs in the infinitive form. Okay, so we searched for an ing form earlier. Here we're searching for the infinitive that works as well. And if we, um, well, click on C frequency by section, we should be seeing the uh, varieties that have been marked in red here. Yeah, so probably. Cameroon and Nigeria, um, yeah, and uh, Malaysia or Singapore. Let's let's check that out. Here we go, Nigeria. Okay, that's good. 
Uh, Cameroon isn't represented in the globe, but uh, well, Nigeria, that's good news. Uh, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, Singapore and Malaysia, not so much, apparently. Yeah, but uh, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. Okay, so there the numbers are a little bit higher than they are in the inner circle varieties where we can assume that this doesn't exist with any amount of currency. Right, um, so here I clicked into the Nigerian bar and we indeed find these examples. Um, we should make them to assist the police. I thank God Almighty for making me to be a Muslim. Yeah, so uh, the Bible made me to understand and so on and so forth. So we do find these examples that uh, the E-Wave has uh, proposed to us. So that's good news. Okay, I want to get to the fourth part of this video in which we'll be working with sections. So do me a favor, go back into the uh, search window of the globe interface and uh, set the search parameters to list. We've been working with the chart option for the last searches and then type something into the search window, namely star and then ism. This search pattern uses a wild card. So the star finds uh, a set of unspecified characters followed by ism. So this finds any word that ends in ism like socialism or feminism or any kind of ism really. Um, but what we really want to do with that, we don't just want to look for those words in general. We want to compare two varieties of English and what kinds of isms appear in those varieties. Let me show you how this is done. So the first thing that you need to do is that you need to click on the word that says sections. Okay, so if you do that, that will make two boxes pop up here. Uh, one that says one, the other one that says two. And in each of these, you have to select one variety. Yeah, so I selected United States in the first window and Great Britain in the second one and they should appear in gray. You can actually select several varieties if you want to compare, for example, inner circle varieties in section one and then outer circle varieties in section two. That's possible. I'll leave you to that if you want to explore that on your own. Now, for now, let's just compare uh, American and British English. And there's a third thing that we need to specify before we hit uh, find matching strings. Namely, uh, down here, I want you to uh, sort by relevance. If this doesn't pop up automatically in your interface, click on sort limit and uh, these windows will appear. Yeah, so sorting should be done by relevance. And uh, here I specified a minimum frequency of zero in section one and zero in, uh, and, and 20 in section two. If something like that pops up automatically in your interface, that's good. If not, then you can just set it to those values. Okay, with all of that in place, we can actually hit find matching strings and see what happens. So this takes us to a new kind of uh, results page where we have two tables side by side in which we get lists with results and frequencies of those results. So what we have in uh, the first section, the United States, is a list of words such as comparativism, trutherism, dominionism, emergentism, Obamaism, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and you see the frequencies with which these words appear in uh, American English and the frequencies of these words in the second section in British English in this case. Yeah, so and what this kind of search does is that it retrieves and lists those examples that are maximally uneven across the two varieties. OK, so comparativism occurs 47 times in American English, but only once in British English. OK, that's the way in which you have to read these tables. These are the isms that are maximally uneven in their distribution across uh, American 
and British English. And uh, predictably enough, these kinds of comparisons bring out um, words that have some kind of cultural significance to the respective varieties. So, for example, in America, we find uh, Obamaism, yeah. <clears throat> And in, uh, in Britain, for example, we find Euroscepticism, uh, there's Blairism and uh, Thatcherism a bit further down. There's also Specialism. I can tell you a little story here. So a long while ago, I had a job interview in uh, Britain. Yeah? And the committee asked me about my Specialisms. And I was... I didn't know what to respond. I hadn't heard that word before. Well, I could figure it out. Yeah. So your specialism in British academia is the kind of stuff that you're working on. So for me, uh, corpus linguistics would have been one valid answer to that question. Anyway, you see that you can use the globe to really uh, contrast uh, two varieties and uh, well, find out words with cultural significance. Um, and I'd like us to uh, do this uh, a little bit more. So try it yourself. Compare American English and Australian English with regard to words that end in uh, E's. Okay. Um, so you can use the search pattern that uh, we've used before and uh, do this and try to find culture specific words that end in E's. Ease. I'd like to come to the fifth and final part of this video in which we'll be investigating collocates across different varieties of English. So do me a favor, go back to the search window of the globe interface and there you'll see that next to the list and chart options that we've been using up to this point, there's another one that says collocates. So please click on the word that says collocates and the search interface will change a little bit. So instead of one search window, there are now two, one that says word slash phrase and another one that says collocates. And then below that, we have these strange looking numbers. Let me explain what all of this means. So first of all, the uh, search window that says word phrase is like the search windows that we've been using up to this point. So I'd like you to type something into that window, namely the adjective expensive. We're looking for expensive things. Um, now, specifically, we're interested in the collocates of expensive. One word to the right. So if we are looking at an expensive noun, yeah, so that is what we would be looking at. Um, so this expression here in the collocate window is n star in angular brackets. And again, this is an expression that finds a word class, instances of a word class, namely any kind of noun. This is what that does. And then the numbers here specify the position where we want this noun to be, okay? So I clicked into the one on the right-hand side and into the zero on the left-hand side. This means that the collocate window that I have specified here is just one word to the right of expensive. That is where we'll concentrate the search. Right, so these settings, if you set up everything like this, this will find word combinations of expensive, the adjective, followed by a noun. If you click on find collocates, you will get results uh, that look like this. So that's yet another kind of results page that the globe provides to us. Uh, it is a bar chart that is sideways and uh, in this column we have all the nouns that are found to the right of expensive in the globe corpus cars jewelry way option car items ones equipment and so on and so forth now our end game here is of course to compare different varieties so let's go back to the search window and figure out how that is done we don't need to adjust very much we just need to click on sections again yeah, and that will bring up on your interface the sections where you can select different varieties that are represented in the globe. So for starters, I would like you to select US for section one, giving us American English and India for section two so that we have a contrast between American English 
and Indian English. What kinds of things are expensive in the US and in India? Let's take a look. Here we are. Healthcare, very expensive in the US. Yeah. Wars, kind of expensive. Yeah. Uh, vacations, well, that's nice at least. Uh, expensive tastes, expensive hardware, expensive campaign. Yeah. So if you if you have plans of going into politics in the United States, you know, this might cost you a bit. Anyway, uh, what is expensive in India? Jewelry, gifts, proposition. I have no idea what is that, but anyway. But in car and cars, of course, cars are expensive everywhere, I guess. Right. Um, now, try this for yourself. What things are expensive in America as compared to Great Britain? Uh, try and change the uh, varieties and see what kinds of things are typically expensive in Great Britain as opposed to the United States. And then change the entire search pattern and look for the adjectives that precede the word marriage in America and in Great Britain. You can think about this first and then uh, write down your hypothesis. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, the marriage results here. Uh, so if you want to do this for yourself, pause the video and then come back. I'm going to continue in three, two, one. Here we go. So the only thing that I'd like to point out here is, um, well, with regard to marriage. Uh, oh, no, no, no. This is. Uh, exp Okay, so here we have the search pattern set up for the adjectives that precede marriage. We have the word marriage and then the tag for any adjective in the collocates window. And we have set up the collocate span in such a way that we're only looking for adjectives that occur one word to the left of marriage. And we've contrasted US English and British English and uh, the minimum frequencies here are set to 20 for both varieties. Now, uh, if we look at the results, there's only one thing that I'd like you to uh, see, namely, well, royal marriages, of course, are way more popular in British data and uh, they're not so frequent in American English. Now, that's it for this video. There's a lot more that you can do with the globe. Yeah, there are lots of options and I invite you to play around with the interface and explore all the different comparisons that you can do across different varieties, across different linguistic structures at the level of vocabulary, morphology and syntax. There's really a lot to do. Have fun with it and I'll see you the next time. See you then. Bye bye.